Antarctica. Pure, untamed, breathtaking. And one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. In the summer, when the sun hangs over the horizon, the average high temperature is 30 below zero Fahrenheit. Then the darkness comes. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, the only doctor at a South Pole research station discovers she has cancer, but the extreme weather makes it too risky to get help. They told me that it would be easier to get us from the space station than from the South Pole in the winter. Even military aircraft can't land in the bitter cold. The weather itself is pretty much our enemy. Airmen volunteer to fly on a dangerous mission into the frigid continent. They will risk their lives to save hers. She was dying, and we needed to get her now. November 21st, 1998. An LC-130 Hercules cargo plane touches down at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Research Station. It's one of three year-round American research facilities in Antarctica. 46-year-old Dr. Jerry Nielsen steps off the plane to begin a new life. Divorced and tired of her job as an emergency room doctor in Ohio, Jerry is eager for a fresh start. It looked like a new deal. And I believe that when things get unmanageable, you should try something different. Jerry will be the sole physician for the research scientists and support staff on what they call simply the ice. On this day, it's 35 degrees below zero. I knew nothing about the South Pole. I knew nothing about Antarctica. When I landed, I felt like my lungs were being burned. I felt that I was no longer on this planet. At the bottom of the world, Antarctica is the windiest, driest, and coldest continent. The South Pole has only one sunrise and one sunset per year. Walt Fischel, one of Dr. Nielsen's colleagues, is familiar with the phenomenon. The sun comes up at the South Pole September 21st, one time, and it stays up. It circles around 24 hours a day until March. There it goes under the horizon, and you will not see that sun until September. Summer here occurs between October and February. These warmer months are critical to human survival. It's the only time of year when the U.S. military can fly in and supply the South Pole Station. It's one of only 47 year-round international research stations on the entire continent. Brian Gomula is with the New York Air National Guard, which along with the Air Force, transports supplies and personnel to the Antarctic. These provisions enable the station to operate throughout the year, this ongoing mission is known as Operation Deep Freeze. Everything that we deliver during our season, they live on during that year to include the fuel that they burn, the food that we've carried in, and the people and medical supplies that support those stations. Jerry Nilsson enters the compound she will call home for the next year, an aluminum dome 55 feet high and 165 feet wide that houses small heated metal buildings. There were little orange buildings, and they were like refrigerators that you lived in, but instead of keeping cold in, they kept the cold out. When you walk inside the dome, it's orange. All of the buildings are orange. It's a, it looks kind of like the Wizard of Oz in there. This is the front of my office. The doctor's private quarters are attached to a two-bed medical clinic, which are housed in the Biomed building. The medical equipment was not state of the art. I had just the basics that a physician would need in a basic clinic. Jerry gets used to her new surroundings and meets more than 200 colleagues, 
affectionately called polies. They come from all walks of life. Walt Fischel is a 31-year-old welder. He's helping to build a new research station that will eventually replace the aluminum dome. The type of people drawn to the South Pole are definitely adventuresome. Very interesting people. I mean, they're the smartest astrophysicist to the, the guy that can wrestle a Kodiak bear. I mean, we had it all. <laughs> it takes Jerry a while to get used to the harsh conditions. I was exhausted by the altitude and by the cold. Nothing but ice as far as you could see. The extreme polar climate leads to unique medical challenges, some from the 9,300 foot altitude. We know that being at altitude will affect wound healing. But the things that I saw were very, very unusual and interesting. Toenails would become thick and heavy, like talons on a bird. People developed gastrointestinal problems. We haven't done much research in these places in the world. During her first few months, Jerry developed strong friendships with her fellow polies, taking part in poetry readings, playing poker, and listening to live music. Life is as normal as it can be in this forbidding place. February 15, 1999. Outside, it is 50 degrees below zero. A brutally cold and dark winter is imminent. On this day, the last passenger plane of the season is about to evacuate most of the crew. Now, only a courageous skeleton staff of 32 men and nine women will spend the winter here. As Dave Fisher, the station's summer manager, prepares to depart, he assures the winter crew. You guys are taking on the toughest job the U.S. Antarctic program has to offer, I think, in wintering over here, and we are there to help you. The police who stay behind throw a party to celebrate their seclusion at the South Pole Station. This is the um, 90 South Bar, right? Soon, temperatures will plunge during the winter darkness. For the next eight and a half months, they will be virtually cut off from the outside world. After February 15th, the temperature stays pretty much below minus 65. And an airplane can operate in that temperature, it just cannot land and take off. Once it hits minus 58 Fahrenheit, the fuel gels and then past that point, it basically freezes and it won't flow like it normally would in an aircraft. Their isolation will be compounded even further by a tenuous communication system. It limits their correspondence. Besides uh, email, which is not 100% functional due to the orientation of the antennas and the satellites uh, at the South Pole, you are isolated until the temperature is conducive to, to land an airplane. The idea that there was no way in or out excited me because I like to test myself. I like to have opportunities to see how strong I can be. March 1st. It's my birthday party. 47. Jerry Nielsen celebrates her birthday. As the Antarctic summer fades to winter, Jerry focuses on all her responsibilities. You have a long list of winter tasks. We did some training because I needed a trauma team. I needed a group of people who could help me in case someone was badly injured. Then one night in early March, while reading research on a patient's medical condition, Jerry inadvertently runs her fingers across her chest. And I found a small lump. I know that the only treatment for breast cancer is early detection and early treatment. I immediately thought, well, I'm going to die. With the arrival of the brutal temperatures, the earliest chance for a flight out is eight months away. Coming up, Jerry Nielsen worries about what to do next while she fears the worst. Our last plane had just left. It was like a death sentence.
March 1999. Dr. Jerry Nielsen detects a small lump in her breast while secluded at this remote American South Pole research station. At this time of year, the average low temperature is a brutal 70 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Military aircraft cannot land here for the next eight months, leaving Jerry with the stark realization that she might die at the South Pole. I didn't think that I could get treatment, so I figured that I was going to die. I didn't know how cancer was going to be and how long it would take to kill me. For three months, Jerry keeps her medical condition a secret from officials. I didn't tell anyone because I figured why in this very dangerous world should I tell people that the only medical person could be dying. June 1999. Winter has arrived. Seasons in the Southern Hemisphere occur opposite to the Northern Hemisphere. The temperatures keep plunging to as low as 100 degrees below zero. Jerry examines the lump in her breast and finds it is growing. It's now the size of a grape. She decides she has to inform the head of the station, Mike Masterman. I realized that I had to tell someone uh, because I was developing large lymph nodes under my arm. It was hurting a lot. June 10th, Jerry gets in touch with her employer, Antarctic Support Associates, which in turn contacts the National Science Foundation, the organization that oversees most U.S. Antarctic operations. Together, officials review the situation. The assessment is grim. At that time of the year, it's total darkness. The temperatures routinely hit minus 100 Fahrenheit, and it's windy. It's probably one of the windiest continents in the world, which create blizzard conditions, whiteout conditions, and very hazardous to flying. The extreme cold could easily disable an aircraft's hydraulic system and cause the fuel to crystallize. A rescue attempt is too risky. While officials begin to work on a contingency plan, Jerry decides to break the news to fellow polis and friends and family back home. I emailed my family and let them know that I had the lump and that it was a concern so that they would hear it from me first. She was just kind of flippant about the whole thing. I knew that it could be serious, but really I thought, oh, usually these things aren't. You know, they're often benign, and so I told her that it's probably nothing. But a shockwave ripples through the close-knit Poli community. They're concerned for the doctor's well-being and their own. At that moment, you're thinking twice about taking any kind of unnecessary risks because your doctor could become incapacitated. Friends back home refer Jerry to Dr. Kathy Miller, an oncologist at the Indiana University Medical Center. Dr. Miller is faced with an unusual problem. Well, our first challenge was to really try and get a diagnosis and find out if this lump really was a breast cancer. Dr. Miller recommends that Jerry undergo a biopsy. The polies band together to help. Among them is Walt Fischel, who once served as an army medic. So I taught Walt how to do the biopsy using a dried up apple and what was left of potato. Performing the biopsy will require inserting a needle into Jerry Nielsen's breast, extracting a tissue sample, and staining it to highlight the cells. Fellow Poli computer specialist Lisa Beal will use a video camera hooked to a microscope to capture the cell stain images that will be emailed back to doctors in the United States. Email wasn't a common everyday thing, and we only had the capability about two hours a day because of the position of the satellite. June 22, 1999. Just as communication satellites begin to move up over the horizon, the procedure gets underway. Jerry receives instructions from doctors in the United States through an internet telephone hookup. Dressed in a hospital gown and using a local anesthetic and ice to numb the area, she performs the biopsy on herself. Walt Fischel assists. They transmit the cell stain images. But old equipment and outdated stain dyes make it impossible for pathologists to read the images. The biopsy is a failure. 
To determine if Dr. Nielsen has cancer, she will need new medical equipment and supplies. Even though planes can't land at this time of year, officials at the National Science Foundation think it might be possible to stage an emergency air supply drop. They turn to the U.S. Air Force for help. The National Science Foundation was concerned that she might have cancer, and so they've asked us, the Air Force, to drop in supplies and medicine to her. We wanted to coordinate that and get the medicine dropped in as quickly as possible. The Air Force, along with the Air National Guard, routinely transports supplies to the Antarctic as part of Operation Deep Freeze. But this type of mission is rare. It was a resupply into the South Pole, something that hadn't been done in the middle of winter in a number of years. Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Golub, one of the mission leaders, is among 22 members of the military who volunteered to fly on this dangerous mission from McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. We had quite a few more than we usually do. We have the pilots, the mission commander, the engineers, the loadmasters, and the navigators. The Air Force packages the medical supplies in large cardboard bundles that will be dropped from the plane using parachutes. Then they prepare a C-141 Starlifter airplane for the extreme weather conditions of the Antarctic. That was a painstaking preparation because we have to wipe off all the grease off all moving parts of that airplane and go back in with a fine motor oil. The grease we know would freeze in that colder weather and we couldn't afford to have, have our flaps freeze in the down position, have doors freeze in the open position, because once something like that happens, we can't return back to base. As the mission draws near, Jerry Nielsen grows anxious. She doesn't want to endanger anyone's life to save hers, but is grateful when the mission proceeds. After I realized that they were going to do it, I was very relieved and so happy that I might have a chance. Major Craig Pike takes on the job as pilot, flying into one of the coldest, most dangerous places on Earth. His high-risk mission is next on When Weather Changed History. We planned for the worst and, uh, and hoped for the best. Failure really wasn't an option. July 8th, 1999. McCord Air Force Base, Tacoma, Washington. A C-141 Starlifter cargo plane prepares to take off on a daring 9,200 mile journey to Antarctica. Once there, the crew will airdrop life-saving medical supplies for Dr. Jerry Nielsen. Nielsen is stationed at the South Pole Science Research Facility. The medical supplies will help determine if a lump in her breast is cancerous. Major Greg Pike will pilot the C-141 Starlifter. Here we are in the, the flight deck of a 141. This is the, the pilot seat. This is where I sat during the flight. The Starlifter takes off from Tacoma. It flies nonstop to Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. There it refuels and departs, conducting in-flight refueling halfway to their next destination, Christchurch, New Zealand. Once in New Zealand, the crew prepares for its final 3,000-mile leg of the journey to Antarctica. Maintenance personnel wipe off excess grease from the plane's wing flaps for flying in polar conditions. They finish loading the bundles, which will be airdropped. Six 350-pound cardboard parcels are filled with medical supplies, including equipment to diagnose Jerry Nielsen's illness and chemotherapy drugs in case she has cancer. Low temperatures at the South Pole in July average around 82 below zero Fahrenheit, far too cold for a military plane to land. Even a flyover is dangerous. As a navigator for the mission, Captain Martin Oliver knows the dangers involved with the unpredictable polar climate. Weather patterns change very quickly. The way that we were gonna drop was a visual drop. So we had to have weather that allowed us to look at the ground and be able to identify our, our target. Making their mission even more hazardous, the crew won't have the benefit of moonlight. The moon will be below the horizon. Typically in the past, our midwinter airdrops, they coordinated around a full moon, so we have some light to, to fly over and do the drops on. This one here, we didn't have the luxury of uh, picking the day that we wanted to do it. There is no room for error. Everything must go like clockwork. 
Deputy Mission Commander Christopher Golub knows how quickly the extreme temperatures of Antarctica can freeze up the aircraft. Normally our airdrop is out the back doors. We couldn't guarantee that if we opened them up, they would close again. Once the cargo is dropped, there will be additional dangers. There was concern about the parachutes not opening on the boxes. Is there anybody who hasn't heard yet that we're having an airdrop? What? July 10th. At the research station, the police get word that the Starlifter has just taken off from New Zealand. It is just over six hours away. The police construct makeshift signals that will help light up the drop zone. We had to douse wood in diesel fuel and put it in metal barrels, which we coined as smudge pots, just for the pilots to see the drop zone. As the plane approaches, winds are calm. The temperature in the ground is 86 degrees below zero, but conditions can shift without warning. The crew has just enough fuel for two airdrops and the return trip. Coming up next on When Weather Changed History, the Air Force will attempt this very dangerous mission. This was their only lifeline. We just knew we had to get this stuff down there as soon as possible. July 10th, 1999, Antarctica. An Air Force C-141 cargo plane is closing in on its destination, an isolated American research station at the South Pole. It will attempt to make an emergency medical airdrop. The station's only doctor needs the supplies to determine if a lump in her breast is cancerous. The entire mission, the weather's on our mind. Every 30 minutes, we were, we were monitoring and contacting people at the South Pole as well as back at Christchurch. What do you see for weather? What are the winds doing? Altitude affected the mission in several ways. One of the problems it posed us is to be breathing oxygen. You have your helmet on and your oxygen mask, so now your vision and your mobility is cut down considerably. Even if the Air Force crew successfully drops the 350-pound parcels on target and intact, the polies down below will need to find them in the darkness, load them onto bulldozers, and quickly bring them inside. All of us were at different places. Some people were spotters on top of buildings to see where the um, packages landed. They had large, heavy equipment to go out and try to pick up these packages because we had very little time before everything would freeze and wouldn't be any good. 9 p.m., the police light their makeshift smudge pots, outlining the drop zone. The Starlifter is traveling at 200 miles per hour. The crew members wear night vision goggles, oxygen masks, and cold weather gear as they close in on the drop zone. And we were hoping that night there'd be a little bit of a moon rise, as we were told by the weatherman, and there was no moon. It was just pitch black. There was no moon illumination at all. 700 feet above the icy ground of the South Pole, the smudge pots are within view. The crew opens the cargo doors. There was a lot of concern with the amount of time they could leave the door open on the aircraft. With the doors open, now the temperature has dropped dramatically. Things start freezing, you're cold, so you're all bundled up. The crew pushes two packages fitted with strobe lights out the cargo doors. We wanted two bundles to go out just to check and make sure everything was going to work. With the wind chill, it was minus 150. It was completely dark. I barely saw the plane fly over. The freezing temperatures extinguish the strobe lights in seconds, but the police spot the packages anyway. They report back to the Starlifter that they will be able to retrieve them. Now the Air Force must circle around and drop the remaining four parcels in the same amount of time and on target. If the cargo was blown away, it would be a logistics nightmare for them to be able to go out in the darkness and be able to retrieve those bundles. Dr. Jerry Nielsen needed those supplies, and so we had to be right on target. The Starlifter circles back and releases the remaining parcels. You can hear all the, all the loadmasters uh, uh, cheering for the excitement of just having accomplished the drop. 
This was very exciting for us all. They started throwing out these packages and we almost felt like it was an Easter egg hunt. The Starlifter sets a return course for New Zealand. On the ground, the Polies find five of the six bundles. An hour and a half later, they locate the sixth parcel. The parachute had failed to open properly. An ultrasound machine lies in pieces on the ice. My friend found it and I saw him and his eyes, all of his eyelashes were frozen, totally solid. And he had to break them in order to get them open. Even though the equipment in the last parcel was destroyed, the polies are ecstatic. They've gotten vital supplies and find there are some pleasant gifts. We felt like as long as we were going down there, let's take some non-essentials. We took down fresh fruit and vegetables, lots of different bouquets of flowers and cards to wish her well. There were all kinds of things in the packages. There was a new movie, fruits and vegetables, and then of course, um, the medication I needed to stay alive. All right, Doc, what do you think about tonight? It was fun. Was it exciting? Yes. Was it an adventure? Yes. Is this the total polar experience? Yes. All right. <laughs> All right, good for you. The airdrop was a success. The flight crew makes it safely back to New Zealand, and Dr. Nielsen has the necessary provisions for a proper diagnosis. Equipped with a new powerful microscope and fresh cell dyes, the makeshift trauma team stains the remaining tissue from the first biopsy and transmits the images over the internet to the pathologists in the United States but the results are still inconclusive. Dr. Nielsen must undergo a second biopsy to extract fresh tissue. I remember the second biopsy was easier to find the tumor. If it was the size of a grape the first time, it was a golf ball the second time. This thing was growing fast. The trauma team sends new slide images to the pathologists. July 22nd. Days after emailing her biopsy images to the States, Jerry Nielsen checks in with computer specialist Lisa Beal and finds out the results have arrived. I read the answer from the pathologist and uh, it was a great shock because I hadn't readied myself and there it was in black and white that I had cancer. In fact, an aggressive form of breast cancer. Her worst fears are confirmed. It would be another three months before favorable temperatures permit a plane to land and evacuate Jerry back to the States. She emails the news to her family in Ohio. The first night when I heard that it was cancer that I just paced and paced back and forth and tears just ran down my cheeks. Well, I just accepted the fact that there's nothing I could do. You know, it's a way of life. She's there and we're here and I hope that for the best and just nothing I could do. In the meantime, with the help of her colleagues, Jerry begins to treat herself with the chemotherapy medications that were airdropped in. During the following week, Jerry keeps up with her work and socializes with her fellow polies. I continued my life. I decided what was important in my life and those are the things that I was going to do. I took my treatment and I continued. During this time, I mean, she was seeing people, cleaning teeth and, uh, and counseling uh, people if they needed it. I mean, she was, she was doing her job well. August 6th, 1999. By the third chemotherapy session, the tumor is responding well to treatment, shrinking in size. But Jerry has been injecting what amounts to poison into her bloodstream. The chemo made me sick. It made me feel like I was walking through jello. I was always so very, very tired. In addition to constant fatigue, Jerry's long hair is coming out in clumps every time she touches her head. Well, welcome to the South Pole edition of Start the Madness. <laughs> she decides to throw a make Jerry totally bald party while fellow polies shave her head. So it's hard to deny your illness when you look at your reflection and you're bald. When I first saw that picture of her bald, of course I cried. But she had a pretty head and it was a little bit in fashion already at that time. September, 
More than a month into her treatment, Jerry is responding well, but her veins are collapsing from the frequent injections. Back in Indiana, Dr. Miller thinks an early rescue might soon be needed. We had been talking with the folks at the National Science Foundation about rescue uh, from the very beginning. Over the next two weeks, Jerry's condition deteriorates. At first, the tumor shrank, and I thought, oh, this is just incredible. This is wonderful. It's working. Maybe I have a chance. But then it started to grow again. In late September, Jerry emails Dr. Miller that the tumor is now growing rapidly. Dr. Miller tells National Science Foundation officials that Jerry's condition is critical, and early rescue is her only hope. Military officials agree to the rescue four weeks before the station is to reopen. This will be one of the earliest South Pole landings in the history of the U.S. Antarctic program. Coming up, the Air National Guard prepares to fly into one of the harshest climates on Earth to rescue Jerry Nilsson. She was dying, and we needed to get her. Now. October 1st, 1999. Winter is finally fading away. The sun is beginning its slow rise above the horizon. Temperatures start to climb, but are still extreme, averaging around 70 degrees below zero. South Pole physician Dr. Jerry Nielsen is suffering from breast cancer. Her only hope for survival is an emergency rescue. Weather conditions make plane landings too risky for eight and a half months out of the year. The station reopening is almost a month away, but with Jerry's life at risk, the Air National Guard will attempt an historic rescue. It will be one of the earliest flights into the South Pole ever. The rescue mission will be launched from Stratton Air National Guard Base in Schenectady, New York. Rescuers will fly in two ski-equipped LC-130 Hercules aircraft from the 109th Airlift Wing and meet up with a third plane in Christchurch, New Zealand. All three planes have a specific purpose. One will rescue Dr. Nielsen, one will be on standby in case of emergency, and one will provide mechanical parts. Lieutenant Colonel Brian Gomula helps coordinate the operation. The 109th Airlift Wing is the only unit anywhere in the world that has large ski-equipped aircraft. That's the unique capability of the airplane, the skis. The airplane is capable of landing on hard runways, normal runways with wheels, and skis in the snow. The plan calls for the two LC-130s to depart the Stratton Air National Guard base in New York and fly halfway around the world, with stops in California, Hawaii, and Pago Pago in American Samoa, before landing in Christchurch, New Zealand. Once in New Zealand, the crews will monitor the weather conditions. When the weather allows, they'll continue on to McMurdo Station on the coast of Antarctica. This will serve as the staging area for the flight to the South Pole. Only one of the aircraft will make the final leg of the journey to the South Pole Station. In my airplane, we were actually going to land at the South Pole and pick up Dr. Nielsen. Major George McAllister will have to land on an icy, snow-blown runway and must keep the engines running. If the aircraft stays on the runway too long, there's a good chance the mechanical parts will freeze and the landing skis will stick to the ice. The bottom is coated with Teflon because anytime you bring 155,000 pounds of, of a sliding airplane to a stop, you freeze in place. So now when you want to bring Dr. Nielsen on the airplane, what we were worried about was the airplane being stuck in place and not being able to get it freed up because of the extreme cold. At the South Pole Research Station, Jerry Nielsen's condition is growing worse by the day. She can only complete the smallest of tasks. I got very tired. I started to have problems with my balance and I was dropping things. October 6th, less than three weeks before the South Pole Station is scheduled to reopen for flights, the two LC-130s take off from New York. 
Four days later, on October 10th, they land in New Zealand. So far, the mission is run just as planned. They refuel and cruise rest. Weather permitting, they'll take off the next day. But the weather doesn't cooperate. The rescue teams are grounded by strong winds and blizzards in Antarctica. The weather itself is, is very dangerous and pretty much our enemy. Whether it's the winds, whether it's a blizzard, or it's very hazardous. Jerry's brothers, Scott and Eric Cahill, have also flown to New Zealand and now anxiously wait for their sister's rescue. I hoped that I would be able to see her before she died. And I think that's the best that we had to hope for at that point. October 13th. After three days, the weather breaks. The rescue planes can finally take off again. Nine hours later, they land at the McMurdo Research Station on the coast of Antarctica. They are now just 800 miles short of the South Pole. The 10-member crew, including the medical team, is anxious to complete the mission, but again, they're grounded due to cold weather. This time at the South Pole, where it's 76 degrees below zero. Jerry's condition keeps deteriorating. The rescue team waits for two long days. We were losing our patience. We're essentially sitting around flight ops, looking at each other, waiting for the, the thumbs up to go. October 16th, on the second day of waiting, a blizzard whips across the South Pole. But while it snows, the temperatures begin to rise. It's still too cold for a landing, but the forecast looks hopeful. Air National Guard pilot George McAllister gets the go-ahead to take off. It was 67 degrees below zero at the South Pole, and it was below weather minimums. So we were banking that that three-hour flight, that the weather would improve and the temperatures would rise. The polies are on standby. It's a bittersweet day for Jerry. The day that they told us that they were coming, we were excited. I was sad because I was leaving all my great friends there on the ice. Three hours after the rescue plane takes off from the coast of Antarctica, it begins to make its descent at the South Pole. The temperature has risen to minus 53 degrees, just barely acceptable for the plane to make a landing. But there's a new problem. The wind has picked up. Whiteout conditions quickly develop. We knew the approach was going to be a big challenge. We started calling into the South Pole saying, you know, prepare Dr. Nielsen and get her up to the onload spot. We heard the plane come and we were shocked because it was a total whiteout. We all felt that it was too hard for the plane to land. So I remember myself hearing the roar of the propellers and thinking that he's not gonna land. There's no way, I mean, he cannot do this. Blowing snow obscures the horizon line and the runway. Unable to make a visual landing, the pilots must rely only on the plane's radar. And the only way I knew they landed was I heard a thud. We let our main skis take the brunt of it. Once we got on the ground, we're saying we've landed and bring Dr. Nielsen out. And they thought we were kidding because the density of the snow was so thick that they didn't see us taxiing up until we got right up to the onload spot. Coming up next, the Polies only have minutes to get Jerry on board before the plane's hydraulics will freeze. We were all prepared. We grabbed the doctor, we zipped her up in a snowmobile. October 16th, 1999, Antarctica. In whiteout conditions, an LC-130 Hercules cargo plane makes an historic landing at the South Pole. Nine days before the research station is scheduled to reopen for flights, the plane touches down on the icy runway in extreme weather conditions. Dr. Jerry Nielsen needs to be rescued. She is suffering from breast cancer and is gravely ill. I had to be helped to the plane. I was so weak. We unloaded Dr. Nielsen very quickly. It might have been the fastest turn at the South Pole. So fast that there's no time for goodbye. Three hours later, the rescue plane lands at McMurdo Station. Jerry is transferred to a waiting plane and flown directly to Christchurch, New Zealand. Once there, 
she is whisked away to a nearby hotel where her brothers, Eric and Scott, anxiously wait. They brought her to the hotel room and we were thrilled to death to see her. She was just like always. She just looked like my sister again. She looked beautiful. Then Jerry is flown to Indianapolis for treatment at the Indiana University Medical Center. For the first time, Jerry has a face-to-face -face meeting with her oncologist, Dr. Kathy Miller. She was everything I thought she would be. She was a great doctor, a very compassionate person. In some ways, it felt like we had known each other for a long time because we had developed a relationship uh, with the video conferencing and over our emails. Jerry undergoes a battery of medical tests to determine the extent of her cancer. One after another test came up clean. And I just I thought, oh my god, maybe there's a chance. Maybe there's a chance. The next day, Jerry has a lumpectomy. It looked like she was going to live. And that was a very happy moment in our lives. Jerry survives. But her battle with cancer is not over. In 2005, her breast cancer recurs, and this time it spreads into her bones. She is treated with radiation and chemotherapy, and she remarries, making the most of every day. I've traveled all over. I am practicing emergency medicine now, and I love it. You can tell that this is a, an adventurous woman who loves life, and I very much admire that. We've been lucky, she's had a magnificent life since she's been back, and a lot of it because of those guys that risked their lives for her. While helping Dr. Jerry Nielsen, the U.S. Antarctic program made history twice, completing one of the first moonless airdrops in extreme polar temperatures, and one of the earliest polar winter air landings. In 2007, a new state-of-the-art research center was completed at the South Pole. Individuals who are drawn to Antarctica are willing to face the extreme challenges of living in a polar climate. People like Jerry Nilsson, who despite her ordeal, has no regrets. It's made me more accepting of the way things are. It makes me like what I do more. And I don't believe so much that I'm dying. I believe that I'm living.